This happened a couple of years ago. I wanted to go to the local wildlife trail to walk in the woods. I had gone several times to hike and jog, and I normally went with my boyfriend at the time, but he was working when I wanted to go. So I decided to go myself, and I felt pretty comfortable going. I parked at the far end of the parking lot in case anyone else showed up. The trail continues straight from the parking lot for about a mile until it curves up a large hill. But where I wanted to go was the abandoned parking lot with the lake. The turn off this part of the trail was about um, 400 yards down the trail on the left, I think. But once you turn left, you have about 200 yards of flat trail before it inclined. The inclined section is loose gravel and it's quite noisy when you're walking up it. But this section lasts for about 100 yards. So... I felt pretty at ease going along the straight trail before I turned left. When I hit the incline, I just began to feel uneasy. I brushed it off as just being overly paranoid though and continued. As I was about halfway up the incline, I began to hear crunching and snapping of trees in the woods to my right. It sounded about a hundred yards off to my right and it was just far enough in the woods that I couldn't see what was making the noise. I froze in my tracks and the hair on the back of my neck stood up. I stood still there as I heard the crunching stop and uh, stupidly, I know, I, I brushed it off as a deer or a bobcat. But the crunching was too loud to be a raccoon or a squirrel. So I continued up the path until I hit the end of the incline. That's when I heard the thing in the woods begin to run at me and I was frozen in fear and my heart was beating a million miles an hour and every hair in my body was standing straight up but I was just rooted in place and... That's when I saw him. A man was running straight for me while holding something in his right hand. I began to run down the incline back to the main trail and I was slipping and sliding down the gravel and I looked behind me and he was now at the top of the incline and he had this evil look in his eyes. I noticed the item in his hand was a knife I think and I almost slipped due to me looking back at the man and he called out to me, get back here. His tone was malicious and I just sprinted as fast as I could and took a hard ride back onto the main path. When I hit the parking lot, I, I didn't look back and I unlocked my car and just started it as quickly as I could and right as I was backing up, he emerges from the trail entrance and he just stands there, partially covered in the shade of the trees. As I tear through the parking lot and onto the highway, he just stares at me and the biggest creepiest smile comes across his face and... He slowly waves at me as I'm getting onto the highway. And well, needless to say, I, I never went back to that trail. That encounter has scared me for life when it comes to hiking in the woods. Oh, and uh, by the way, no, I didn't call the police or file a report. Yes, that was a very stupid thing to do, I know, but I couldn't call the police after it happened because I didn't have a cell phone. The nearest police station was about 45 minutes away, so by the time I arrived there, the man would have been long gone. But looking back at it, I, I know I should have still reported it, but I was a shaken up teen that, honestly, didn't know what to do. When I was younger, we would stay at my aunt's house when my family visited my mum's hometown. They had a lab and we only ever had a hypoallergenic dog and I got a rash from it and oddly it spread, well, down there if you know what I mean. My mum says its cause was I was a kid and I probably wasn't washing my hands and then going to the bathroom with whatever I was allergic to still on my hands. Dog hair I guess or perhaps dandruff, I don't know. Either way, my mum took me to the dermatologist right when I got home because it had not gone away. Neither of my parents used a dermatologist, so they asked friends for a recommendation. My mum is a doctor, so she did look into this guy before she took me to him, and he had a good reputation. When we met with him, and I do remember parts of this, he checked over everything and said it wasn't much to be worried about and gave me a steroid for it. He then asked my mum if he would be able to take a picture of the rash to document it for his research. Now, my mum being a doctor is pretty okay with using cases for research and whatnot, I know this because I'm used for a research study since I had certain hip surgery at such a young age, but she felt like this was just off. She said that she really didn't think of him asking in a, any sort of creepy way, but she said that regardless if it was a rare case to be documented, she would never let a doctor take pictures of her four-year-old daughter's private parts. But she said that the biggest red flag was that he had just said it's a, a common thing and not to worry about it. 
My mum being in medicine knows that this means there's an extensive research on it and a picture of a common rash did not make sense. Well, she forgot about it and obviously didn't take me back. She told her friends that recommended him about it, but we all kind of just forgot about it. That was until we saw him on the news. He was arrested at the American and Canadian border and was found in possession of more than 200 pictures and videos of child porn. So, thank you, Mum, for not always putting your trust in doctors or people who we should put our trust in. My wife and I just moved into a new apartment on the top floor of our four-story complex. I think it used to be an office space or something because the layout was just a, a little bit off. It was a big U-shape with a large bedroom on the inside of the U, with the other rooms and the kitchen space on the outside. It was really big, but I guess the layout made it a hard sell because we got a pretty nice price for it. But both ends of the U-shape had doors on them that opened to the hallway outside of our apartment. The bedroom in the middle also had two doors that opened to the legs of the U-shape, and if you opened both of them, you could see straight through the bedroom. Like I said, it was a weird layout, but kind of novel. So, I moved in first because I worked from home at the time and needed my work computer set up ASAP. I spent the first night alone there while my wife stayed at our previous place with the bulk of our stuff. This place had a buzzer that opened the front door and our apartment had an intercom with three buttons but they weren't labelled. Night falls and I'm chilling in the new place, mostly watching stuff on my iPad and wondering how we're going to use the space when I hear the intercom beep. I walk over to it and wait a moment because I'm honestly not sure how it works and it beeps again. I hold down the first button and I hear the speaker turn on but it's just dead air. I ask who's there and get no response and I kind of hear that someone's there though but they just aren't saying anything. I ask again who it is and still nothing. I figure that maybe I need to hold in the second button to talk to them, so I hold it in and ask again and still nothing. After a few seconds though, I, I hear a door open and close and then there's real silence like nobody's there. I'm a little unsettled by this, so I call my wife to ask if she's trying to get in. She picks up and she says that she's at home and I tell her about the intercom and she says that the first button is to listen, the third button is to talk, and the middle button buzzes them into the building. And at that moment, I'm standing by one of the front doors and I hear someone slam open the stairwell door just outside of it. Just a moment later, someone tests the handle on my front door. Luckily it's locked and deadbolted, but in a moment of panic I realize that the other door is unlocked and I hear the person in the hallway walking towards it. I sprint through the bedroom to the other door and reach it at the same time as the person outside does and I slam my full weight into it like Dr. Grant on Jurassic Park and spin the deadbolt closed. They test the handle but then they go back to the stairwell. But my wife is still on the phone during this and is freaking out because she's just heard me run and tackle a door to keep it closed and I'm explaining to her what happened and as I'm doing it, the intercom beeps again. I freeze and just a moment later, it beeps again. This time, I hold in the listen button and again it's the dead air like before, but you can tell that someone's there. After a few seconds, I hear the building's outer door open and close and they're gone. I asked the building manager about it, but he said that he didn't see anything on the cameras for the time I mentioned. Nobody. This happened to my parents before I was born. Back then they lived in a small rented house and were quite poor and my dad studied and went from job to job and my mum worked as a teacher. They also helped themselves a bit by selling bread which my dad baked in the house's kitchen. Now my dad's pretty skeptical and even he felt uneasy there. They would always see doors closing and they'd hear steps or what sounded like a woman crying in empty rooms and... Also, the kitchen, which was very small and only had a little window, was just always cold. Even when baking the bread, my dad had to wear a sweater, which was really strange since we lived in a tropical country. But my mum, on the other hand, has always been a firm believer in the supernatural and also very scared of it. They both think, though, that that's why this all hit her the hardest. 
She's always had trouble sleeping and constant nightmares, but the last straw was one day they got up in the morning and my mum was pale like he'd never seen her. In his words, she looked like a corpse. By next week, they were living with my grandma and only took a few personal belongings with them, clothes and stuff like that. They remember that moving was a, a bit comical because they asked a priest's advice beforehand and he told them that they should swear aggressively while stating that this stuff was theirs and they wanted no one accompanying them where they were going. And fortunately for them, nothing as aggressive has happened to them since then. We lived in a few homes growing up where we had paranormal experiences. I wouldn't say it was that we had bad luck necessarily. I, I think it was more of a, a gift or something, depending on how you perceived it. This was one of the most frightening experiences my siblings and some friends had while I'm alone though. So at 15, I was the second oldest of four kids. My parents separated right after my 13th birthday. Among the many changes was our new home too, and we had just rented it but were unaware of its own complicated history. The owner had apparently been electrocuted and died while working on the roof attempting repairs. His wife had not mentioned this when we first moved into the home, and oftentimes the lights would just flicker or go out entirely while one of us were in the middle of showering. But this almost exclusively always happened in the master bathroom and bedroom, his part of the house. Just as you would get out of the shower to yell for someone to check the fuse box, they would just go back on. You'd return to shower and then it would go off again. It was kind of like a, a scary game that only the other party enjoyed playing. The house seemed to prefer the darkness and eventually the kids just stopped using the bathroom in that room altogether. But one night I was home babysitting my sister and brother. They must have been 13 and 11 respectively. My boyfriend had brought his best friend over to keep us all company and kind of hang out. Even he knew that it was always more frightening to be in the house alone at night. So we sat in the living room watching television and snacking and from our seated positions the television was off to the left and the dining area to the right. Hallways are both directly behind and in front of us that would lead off to different parts of the home. And as we talked and teased each other I began to hear noises off to the right coming from the kitchen. At first, it was easy to convince myself that I was hearing things. Every time I would look up at the sound, there was nothing, but it wasn't long before the noises became just more frequent and louder. Undeniable, in fact. At first, there was creaking tiles as if someone had turned the corner into the kitchen. Of course, nobody was there. But then, the plates started shifting in the dryer and on the countertop. Then, the creaking of the cupboards and the pantry door as they slowly and methodically opened. But nobody was speaking anymore and all of us were nervously looking around trying to communicate with one another without saying anything. Shaking my head at my boyfriend, I was asking him to not address the sounds and obvious fear we all felt. I didn't want my brother and sister upset and it was already close to 10 at night and where would we even go to? I remember raising the volume of the movie, hoping to drown out the noise, when from my peripheral vision, I saw a black shadow... A figure walked the length of the room in front of us. It was something of a den that opened into the back end to the master bedroom and bath. Again, his part of the house. The front part entered into a room that opened into the living room where we sat now, and directly looking up, I didn't initially see anything, so I just prayed silently that it was just my imagination. But again, a dark shadow figure walked the length of the room. Looking up, there was nothing there, but... Another time, quicker now, a, a more hurried pace, three, four, five times now, and then the figure was no longer in my peripheral vision. It was outright stalking back and forth in the length of the room. But not only was it darker now, but it was much larger too, taller. It seemed to encompass so much more space than a few minutes ago, and our unwillingness to acknowledge its presence had seemingly angered it or something. It loomed larger as it stomped back and forth faster and faster, and after each turn it seemed to whip around. I looked at my brother and sister and saw that they too were clearly aware of this presence. And my friend saw it also, and everyone was just seemingly frozen. And nobody spoke or even moved a muscle. The shadow also now seemed to be in a rage, and it had taken on a darkness that just permeated the room. It had grown so large that the top of its head was no longer visible. 
It let out noises that sounded like heavy breathing and grunts, and suddenly, the kitchen just erupted in a cacophony of sounds. Every cupboard began to slam open and shut. Dishes shook so loud that I was sure that they were being broken. The back door was violently struggling against its lock, the doorknob twisting and turning as unseen hands tried to open it. Simultaneously, everyone was up at this point and out of their seats in an instant. The explosion of sounds from the kitchen had prompted action on all of our parts, and we just hit the front door screaming and yelling. Pulling at it, though, we initially couldn't get it to budge. My younger sister had actually been trampled in everyone's hurry to escape, and when the door finally was opened, she was still on the floor crying. My boyfriend ran in just enough to drag her out by her arms, and we ran into the darkness several blocks to a friend's house, where we all tried our best to explain what had just happened. Luckily for us, my mum believed us because she admitted she'd had experiences of her own and they were just unexplainable. We lasted just a year in that home and as far as we know, it still sits unoccupied. Families just moving in and out and never staying very long. To this day, it all just seems so unreal. I'm from the northeast Pennsylvania area where nothing too exciting usually happens. When I was in high school, or more specifically the 11th grade in 2014, there was a man who shot two police officers and killed one. After he did this, there was a search for him all around Pennsylvania and the states around and he was on America's Most Wanted. I'm sure if you do some research you can find his name, but anyway... Police around our area were sure that he was in the woods somewhere, so they made it clear for everyone not to be out too late and to lock your doors at night. But one night, my friend and I were driving around our area late at night, especially because, like I said, there was nothing to do in our area, and we got to a main road and my friend starts to slow down. I was on my phone scrolling through my music playlist to pick what song to play next. I looked over to her when she slowed down and I noticed she was on her phone quickly. Since it was late at night, there was not a single person on the road, so she decided to go about 5 miles per hour and just answer someone quick. But we continued going slowly and on our phones until something told us to both look up. At the same time, we looked up and we see a man in total black from head to toe, walking on the yellow lines in the middle of the road. We didn't think anything of it, to be honest, until he walked towards our car fast enough to catch up. We sat in silence until the man, who just looked like a black figure at this point, reached for my friend's driver's door handle. We both screamed at the top of our lungs and my friend pressed on the gas and we didn't slow down or stop until we reached the next town. A couple of weeks later and the man was found right in that area where we were. We don't know if it was actually him, but we have a fairly good idea that it definitely could have been. So, I probably don't need some sort of long-winded introduction to instill this one simple fact. Being in the woods alone can be creepy as hell. So one early afternoon, I was driving home from a friend's and passed by a secluded little park. I knew the park had a few hiking trails that led to this massive cliffside overlooking a valley and a forest. The photos I'd seen of the view were just totally breathtaking, so I decided I need to check it out for myself. It was an absolutely beautiful summer day and early enough in the afternoon that I figured I wouldn't scare myself at the small sounds of nature. I pulled into the empty parking lot, parked my car, checked the map and started along the widest path. It was the easiest looking path that consisted of climbing over a few rocks and some small hills and it was also the most clear of the paths with few curves and little brush. About halfway through I came upon a small hill that led down to a large clearing. As I came up to the top of the hill, I saw a little old man with white hair sitting on the rocks at the bottom of the hill. I walked down and I smiled at him. But where are you heading? He asked with a smile and a pleasant tone. I told him that I was trying to get to the cliffs and his demeanor just quickly changed. He said, you should be careful. I figured that he was just trying to be helpful as I was five foot tall, a teenage girl and the cliffs were very high and overlooked an incredibly steep valley. I smiled, thanked him, and began to continue walking. And then, with an incredibly blank stare and flat tone, he insisted, No, you really need to be careful. It no longer seemed like a friendly warning, and 
I explained I hiked a lot and was confident in my ability to handle the cliffs and thanked him again for his concern. But then he said, a lot of teenagers come out here to look at the cliffs, and he pauses, and a lot of them never come back. I nervously laugh at this. I mean, he has to be kidding, right? But then he says, it's almost as if someone is pushing them off. And the look in his eyes and the tone of his voice just sent a chill down my spine and told me that this wasn't a joke. In fact, it kind of sounded like a threat. Being that I'm very paranoid, specifically in the woods, I figured I was just being dramatic and I thanked him one last time and continued heading down into the direction of the cliffs. He remained silent and I only made it a few steps away from the clearing when I realized that I could just not shake this feeling. The old man had freaked me out way too much for me to continue on and enjoy myself. So I turned back around towards the clearing and realized that he was no longer there. I hadn't heard him move and I couldn't see him in the very clear path ahead of me. Only a few seconds had passed since we parted ways too. Well, I hastily set off the way that I'd come and intently listening for any sound surrounding me. I made it safely to the empty parking lot with no issues and that's when I realized that the parking lot had been empty this entire time, even when I first arrived. So... Where did this man come from and where did he go? I jumped in my car and threw it into drive and sped all the way home. But nothing ever happened and my tires weren't slashed. I didn't see eyes peering out from the forest as I drove away or anything and I never saw the man again. And I sadly never went back to see the cliffs either. But I could just never shake this feeling that I got in those woods. Maybe he was just a friendly old man worried for my well-being. Maybe he was my guardian angel saving me from a clumsy fall. Or maybe he was planning to maliciously throw me off the cliff or something. I guess I may never know. This was the first and only time that I ever used my emergency code word with my mum. My dad was in a band and some of his band members were in a country band that had a performance on 4th of July. It was taking place in a ranch type area near a highway and when I got there I quickly realized that everyone there was either 20 years older than me or 10 years younger. I was 17 at the time and so I realized that I most likely was going to be there bored for 3 hours. But one of the band members wives brought over a girl who looked to be my age though. She introduced her to me and treated her like a friend. The girl, who we'll call Sarah, started talking with me and asked if I would like to go for a walk around the field. I agreed and so we set off. We started talking about school and it turns out that she was a year younger than me and she was homeschooled. I told her that I went to an old girls Catholic school and she started talking about how she thought most girls were pretty narky and nasty and that she practiced witchcraft. I thought it was kind of weird, but I tried to be open-minded, so I wasn't trying to judge her. We finally got to the side of the field that couldn't be seen by the people at the event, but was right next to the highway, and there we came across the body of a, a dead deer. She looked at me and said, I really wish I could take its hoof. I wonder if I have any bags on me. I thought that she was joking, but she reached into her backpack and pulled out a knife and a brown paper bag. She went over to the dead deer and started soaring at its foot but she couldn't get all the way through so she tried to get me to help her but I said no so she put down the knife and ripped the hoof off with her bare hands and at this point I was honestly freaking out because she had just been talking about how she liked violence and didn't really care about people being hurt she grabbed the hoof and put it in the bag and then put it in her backpack she was still carrying the knife and I tried texting my mum but there was no service where we were standing. We kept walking and she was talking about how she would put curses on people that she didn't like and how she was completely desensitized to death and the killing of animals because she had grown up on a farm where she watched her mother cut the heads off of rabbits. We kept walking and came across a fork in the road and she said that we should go one way. And then... She told me that she wasn't going to chop me into pieces or anything because that doesn't happen much these days. We finally got to the place where there was cell service and I texted my mum our code word. She told me to get back to the barbecue and we would leave right away. 
Sarah asked me if I had to leave, and I told her that whenever my grandma got to our house that we would have to go home and meet her. I mentioned something about her bringing her dog named Buddy, and Sarah got excited about the name. She said that she had a dog named Buddy who she set free in the wild, and he was eaten alive by coyotes. But it was okay because he died happy or something. We finally got back to where everyone was and my mum said that we needed to get back home. Sarah then asked for my phone number as she had seen my phone and I agreed and put in a fake number before my parents and I walked away. As soon as we were out of eyesight I ran to the car and my parents got in the car and asked me if she had pulled out drugs or something. And boy, I wish that would have been the case because I would have known at least how to handle that. Ever since I was 14 years old, I've been scared of lightning. It started when I was out in a soccer field during a thunderstorm and lightning struck the fence, just over 100 feet away from me. But the sound was just deafening and I can still remember the awful sensation of the sound vibrating through my whole body. But this wouldn't be my only incident involving a lightning strike that I came too close to. And the next time, it wouldn't only scare me, it would also be my salvation. So when I turned 20, I moved out from my parents who live in the capital of my country to a small community in the south and I have no intention of moving back. Sure, uh, a girl that grew up in the city is used to the endless variations of restaurants and bars and stores that never close and a city that never sleeps, but to be honest, I really like it here. Despite the low population of the community and something of a sleepy town stamp on it, it's charming with its colourful wooden houses, the seaside campus and the smell of butter from the old butter factory as an eternal reminder of where you are. I can practically go out whenever I want and wherever I want and meet a total of 10 people, the neighbourhood cat and, if I'm lucky, a cute but lost hedgehog. There is one more reason though why I appreciate living in a small town and it's how incredibly safe I feel here. In the city, you can barely be outside alone as a woman after 10pm without feeling just such discomfort that you feel compelled to check behind you once or twice every minute. All such discomfort, however, doesn't only happen after said time or during the darkest hours of the day. It can happen any time, but that is something that you learn and something that I had to learn. So I was 17 and it was the summer holidays. I was spending most of my time at my then boyfriend's house and he lived with his family about 20 minutes outside of the city. I lived with my parents at the time in the city centre, just along the green subway line, so if I wanted to get back home I had to take the commuter train to the central station, walk across it and switch to the green subway line and ride a few minutes on there to get to my station. I was then in one of my rebellious periods and had a month of bleaching my hair and I loved it at first but after a while my roots started to show and I realised my mistake. My angel of a mother had tired of my fuss over it and booked me at the hairdresser so that I could go back to my natural deep brown hair colour. The day for my appointment at the hairdresser came and I was as usual at my boyfriend's but I needed something for my parents' apartment first so I put on my headphones and jumped on the commuter train. I switched as usual to the green line and sat near one of the doors that I knew would line up perfectly to where I would get off. I also like to crowd watch people when I travel. Not to stare people out or anything like that, but just to look at people and think about where they're going and what they do for work or maybe make up a, a story about them or something. It's a kind of game that I often find myself playing on the subway or commuter train when I'm bored. And I played that game that day. I looked around at the people and when there was one station left until my stop, my eye stuck to a man who was sitting a few feet in front of me. He was tall, perhaps in his mid-thirties. His hair was dark and scruffy, wearing dark clothes and big boots. He sat with his elbows leaning against his knees, scratching slightly down towards the subway floor. But today, I, I don't remember what my analysis or fictional story was of him, but I know that I saw him. The woman in the speakers shouted out my destination, and I stood up, and I went to the doors and stepped off. When I got out of the doors of the station, I saw that it had started to rain, so I pulled my big hood over the headphones and started to quickly walk up to the apartment, which was only a few hundred feet from the station. The apartment is an old building with a large wooden door facing the street. The door has a glass pane that runs along the entire door, and when you enter the staircase, is entirely in marble with an old wooden elevator with an iron lattice door that you have to close manually. 
When I got into the door, I put in the entry code and I pushed up the door. When the door was swung aside, something was reflected in the glass and I turned around and saw the man from the subway standing behind me. At first, I was a little shocked that he was so close to me, but I assumed that he was one of my neighbours or a neighbour's friend. I also assumed that he stood so close to me because it rained and he didn't want to get wet, so I said hello and pressed up the door an extra time with my hip while I took off my headphones. But he didn't answer. I went to the lift and pressed the button, but I heard that it didn't start, so I assumed that the neighbours had opened the lattice door to park the elevator at their floor while they locked their door or something. I turned around and I saw the man standing behind me, shaking. Now, it wasn't a type of typical shaking that's common if you get a fever or a cold, but more like a, a spastic twitching or something. He stood there jerking with his head and back as curved as he had on the subway, but this time his eyes were not on the floor, they were on me. He opened his mouth to talk, but only incoherent sounds came out while the shaking and the jerking became just more frantic. But what's your name? He said at last, and I remember my parents' word of wisdom to never tell your name to a stranger, especially one whom one feels threatened by. I wanted to tell him to go, but I felt like I was frozen and provoking him might make the situation worse, so I replied with a false name, and then he asked, do you live here? I lied and answered that I don't, that I'm just here to see a friend. I remember thinking that I was smart, because now he didn't know my name or where I lived, I thought, but it was at this point he started to move closer to me. I started backing up, and he must have seen the fear in my eyes, but he continued, scuffling towards me. I heard the elevator engine start ticking and that it was on its way down. He told me that he's been following me on the train and that he saw me there and that he had just followed me. And it was now that he lifted his head from his previous position, showing how tall he really was, and the shaking stopped. And he spoke again. He said, You're the most beautiful thing that I've ever seen. And if I thought I was frozen before, that was an understatement. I was now pressed against the elevator door and he was so close that I could feel his scent. Now, some may think that these words still may have been somewhat flattering, but the way he said it, it sounded like a, a death sentence almost. Like something bad. Bad for me. It was about then that I heard the elevator stop on the first floor and someone walked down the stairs to the courtyard door. That door is located on a small platform between the ground floor and the first floor stairs. You also know how you can recognize and distinguish your parents' steps from others. I did this with these steps that came down the stairs and I heard that they were my father's. I quickly thought that I would scream for him but then I realized that the man would know that I lied then and that he might get angry and do something to my old father. And that was when my father opened the door to the courtyard and the lightning struck the yard. The sound waves of the cracking lightning pressed itself through the open door and made the whole marble stairwell scream. And at that point, I screamed and the man screamed. I went to my usual position regarding the thunder and the lightning, fetal position on the floor. He, on the other hand, jumped backwards and started running out, while he shouted that we'll be seeing each other again soon. I barely realized what had happened and I went crying up the elevator and into the apartment where I told everything to my mother and also father when he came up from the courtyard. We reported the incident to the police and I went and dyed my hair, which made me feel a little safer as my appearance changed quite drastically. I was still a little scared after the incident, but also confused. I just kept thinking about what he was saying when he ran out. That we'll be seeing each other again soon. I knew at least that I absolutely did not want to see him again, but unfortunately, I didn't get what I wanted. About a month passed and I had practically forgotten about the situation. I was on my way to the central station to meet up with my boyfriend who was on the commuter train on his way to me and I stood and waited for him in the hallway between the commuter trains and the subway. In that particular hallway a lot of people are walking, either to the trains or from the trains, and very few people are standing still in it. As I said, I stood there, looked down the hallway from time to time to try and see if my boyfriend had come yet when I see someone else standing still. There was someone standing on the other side of the crowd and although everyone goes in different directions and creates a kind of a, a blurred effect on him, I, I could definitely see who it was. And I freeze just like before. 
He stares at me, not like our first meeting though, but as if he's trying to make up if I am who he thinks I am, but behind the dark hair that is. And then, my boyfriend comes from the crowd and hugs me, and I have to look away from the man a few seconds to hug him back, and I leaned my head against his shoulder and looked over to see if the man was still there, but then he was gone. And after that, I, I haven't seen him since. But my question is, has he seen me? My parents were with friends on a night out and my sister was with them. I was home alone and just laying in bed. My family has had a history of hauntings and just weird activity, but for the longest time I was so invested in the paranormal, I myself got scratches and started getting affected. I told myself that maybe if I stop being so into the paranormal stuff that I'll be left alone. Now, at around 10.30pm, I was laying in bed and everything was quiet. But this morning, my neighbor was asking my father why they were screaming and banging doors and stairs very loudly. My dad was like, what? I wasn't even at home. So we asked another neighbor and they said the same. They apparently heard my mother and sister and father shouting and they woke up and were actually contemplating calling the police due to how loud it was. Doors were literally slammed and stairs were pounded on extremely loudly. A car even stopped to bang on our wall to ask if everything was okay. But the crazy thing is that, besides the car stopping, I, I didn't hear anything. No screaming, no door slamming, no footsteps on stairs, no banging on the wall. I, I did hear the car drive away, but that was it. And I don't know how to explain this. Does anyone have any answers? So it was exactly midnight when I was sat in my bedroom watching TV when I heard a cough that sounded loud. Now, my bedroom is the window that you can actually see in the video that I'm about to show you, so I'm right next to the front door. Anyway, I hear this cough and it sounded like it was outside, but I didn't really bat an eyelid because my mum was in the room directly behind mine and she often coughs and I can hear her through the wall, so not uncommon. I leave it for five minutes and hear another cough again pretty loud, but again I ignored it. I heard my mum leave the room and come into mine. She asked me what I was looking for outside and I was really confused and said that I wasn't outside. She then brought up the three videos of this guy just stood outside our house for a solid ten minutes. It's important to know at this point that I live down a long private road that backs onto a nature reserve so there's trees and bushes surrounding the entire house. So, the only way to get to my house is from the road. I live at the very bottom of this road, so he would have had to have passed another, like, 30 to 40 houses to get here. Anyway, we open the door to this guy still standing there, and the conversation goes as follows. Uh, can I help you? Uh, yeah, um, I'm trying to find my way out, and I thought I'd knock on your door because, well, I, I saw lights were on. Uh, okay, well, you definitely didn't knock because we would have heard it, so please don't lie to me. How did you get here in the first place? Uh, I'm just trying to find a way out, okay? This goes on for a while before we get annoyed because clearly he's making no effort to leave, so we told him to just get lost. Well, I'd like you to leave now, please. The guy starts to walk around our house and not towards the exit. No, the exit is over this way. I know the way out, alright? The guy then starts to make his way to our side gate. Remember I said that our house is surrounded by trees and bushes? Well, this gate hasn't been used for the last 17 years or so. It's overgrown like hell and you can't exactly see it unless you know it's there or climbing through the bushes for some reason. As he goes off that way, I head up our driveway and my house is lower down to the drive and I go and watch him. Just outside the side gate is our neighbor's house, which has a little section of road that is only outside of their house, so when they park cars there, nobody minds because, well, it's out of the way. So when I head up to see if he's actually left, surprise, surprise, he's still here and now walking around our neighbor's car. It certainly doesn't seem like a person who wants to find his way out. So again, we tell him to leave and point him in the right direction. 
He heads off up the road all the while I'm hanging around to make sure he leaves, so I give it a minute and I look down the length of the road to where it splits into a T-junction. And I can't see him anywhere, but then he appears walking from right to left, stops in the light of the streetlight, and continues to just stare at me. I pretend to walk off at this point and come back a few seconds later. Again, he's not there, but after a few seconds, he's now walking from left to right and he sees me again and yells, you don't have to keep watching me. So, right now, he's walking back and forth along the top of my road. I hide again, give it a couple of minutes and walk up the road to see if he's still there, and nothing. I spend the next 30 minutes or so walking up and down my road to make sure he's gone and I can't find him, so I don't know if he passed out in a bush or what, but... That was the last time that I saw him. I'm a mature female and I used to live in a 55 plus retirement building. Pretty much the last place that people go to live before they die. And although it's 55 plus, the average age of the residents was well over 70. So... Uh, to begin, I, I want to mention that I've had paranormal or just plain not normal experiences since I was a small child. I moved into the apartment building back in 2010 with my dog Precious and I moved out in 2016. I live in New England and these buildings used to be old mill buildings. Mine was from the 1800s and it was a smaller building with about 28 apartments. There was a basement level with the laundry room and other apartments. The first floor, second floor and third floor. I lived on the second floor, so I was high up. I lived in an end unit, which was nice, and I had adjoining neighbours. One shared a living room wall, and one shared the perpendicular kitchen and bathroom wall. My living room wall that was shared with a very nice man was made of brick, so there were no privacy concerns, and the lady on the other side was just simply never home, which was pretty nice. The original lady downstairs below me was elderly, and her adult sons would come over and check on her and take care of her. One day, I was using my blender making a smoothie when there was a really loud bang on the floor. So hard that I could feel it right under my foot. It was like someone just banged a broomstick really hard on the ceiling downstairs. I was taken aback. I mean, what the hell? Was the blender making that much noise? The bang was directly under my feet though, and this becomes relevant later. So one day, a few months after that around 5.30am, I hear a loud bang and rumble that woke me up. I knew immediately that this elderly lady had fallen, so I called the police. It took them about 10 minutes to get into the apartment, and sure enough, she was on the floor next to her bed. Two days later, I ran into her sons in the hallway and learned that, unfortunately, the lady had a stroke and had died that day. I also found out that she had been restricted to a wheelchair and was really frail. I mentioned the smoothie incident and apologized for making so much noise, assuming that one of her sons was banging on the ceiling, and they had no idea what I was talking about. But it definitely wasn't the lady, of that I'm sure, so I don't know who was banging on the ceiling. And remember this because it's important. So the next lady who moved in downstairs also had a dog, so I saw her in passing outside and made small talk with her, which actually turned out to be us talking to each other's dogs instead of each other, but she was nice enough. And then there were the upstairs neighbors. Oh boy. The floors creaked in the apartment all the time, so I had to get used to that, but for the first two years, it was always just your average occasional walking around, completely easy to get used to and ignore, and it actually took a long time for me to meet the lady upstairs, Mary. Maybe about six months after I moved in, I was standing outside by the front door with Precious and Mary comes walking out of the door. I immediately knew it was her because I wasn't familiar with this woman and as soon as I saw her, I gasped. There was just something really creepy about this woman. She just reeked of creepiness. It's the only way I can explain it. Her face was just so wrinkled and it looked like it was melting off almost. Her eyes had bags on their bags and she was slightly hunched and it was maybe 85 pounds soaking wet. She was just really thin and she had really wiry curly hair. To be honest with you, she just really startled me at first and then I felt bad about judging this old woman by her looks. So I nervously smiled and introduced myself and we chatted a little. 
I asked her how long she'd been living there, and she said 20 years. And I'm doing my math in the head, as this is a 55-plus year building. And this was a little bit weird to me, her being there that long, living by herself, but hey, I, I guess she's an old maid or something. So am I. Not 20 years or anything, but whatever, right? So, over the next three years, everything was just going really nicely. Although, I, I did notice that my dishes were going missing, but I just kind of explained it away as me being mistaken. I also started noticing that a few times, for several weeks at a time, every time I went to the bathroom, Mary was in the bathroom upstairs, walking around, creaking and then flushing. I totally thought that it was just a coincidence and was actually quite funny. It would last for a few weeks and then stop for months. But the end of 2013 was just a, a very dark time. In November, during Thanksgiving, Precious got really sick and started coughing and couldn't breathe, and by the next week, December 4th, she passed away from heart and lung cancer that I had no clue that she even had. She was 8 years old and of a breed that should have lived to at least 12 or 14. And to be honest, I was pretty devastated. I spiraled down into the deepest depression that one could ever get into. I honestly just wanted to be with her and my mind was gone and I didn't cry. I wailed for hours. I pulled out my son's old teddy bears and hugged and slept with them and I just cried on them and my heart was aching and my stomach hurt and the vibes in the apartment just changed. My son would tell me that it just felt different in there, weird and uncomfortable. The energy I was giving off just permeated the entire place. Despair, darkness and pain. During my crying fits while on my bed, I could hear the familiar creak upstairs right above me and then it would just go quiet and then creak and then nothing and I began to just feel so uneasy, wondering if this woman was listening to me cry. The separation between upstairs and downstairs was just the subfloor upstairs and a drop of ceiling downstairs, no insulation, no cement, nothing, so you could hear everything between the floors. But around December 21, I, I found my new little girl. Her name is Buffy. She was eight weeks old and very tiny. It was still very hard for me to get through the day and I still cried a lot, but the needs of Buffy helped me to just keep moving. In 2014, when Buffy was around three months old or so, I would leave her in the kitchen with the gates up whenever I left the apartment. She would have access to the bathroom where her pee pad was, and my bedroom was near the kitchen, so I made it a point to close the bedroom door every single time that I left the apartment. This was as important to me as making sure the stove was off or the iron was off, and I never forgot to close the door. She was still at the stage where she just got into everything and my room was definitely not puppy proof. But at times I would come home and that bedroom door would just be wide open. I'm talking all the way open to where the door was against the wall. Now, even if I accidentally left the door open, I never opened the door that wide. And this honestly started to give me chills. At first, I convinced myself that I must have just left it open, but I knew deep down that I just didn't. But that was just really the only thing that made sense, because there was no way that someone would break in and just to open the door, right? But there's no sign of break-in, and it's not like I live in a high crime building or anything. I mean, come on, it's just a bunch of quiet old people. Once I was taking a shower, and of course I closed the bedroom door because I couldn't see Buffy, when I got out of the shower about 10 minutes later, the bedroom door was wide open again, all the way to the wall. And at that point, I just got a sinking feeling in my stomach. And from there, things just kept escalating. I would be woken up in the middle of the night by various things, and one night I was woken up by a man saying loudly, a hum and the sound was right outside of my room around the corner in the living room and I'm frozen thinking the intruder is in here. I'm wide awake feeling around for my huge hunting knife that I keep next to my bed and then I hear it again. I lay there waiting for him to come into my room and I didn't know how long I waited there but after a while I got up enough guts to check it out, knife in hand, and I slowly walked around the corner to my living room and... I keep a nightlight in my bathroom, so the living room was slightly illuminated, and I did a quick scan of the living room and saw nothing. Then I went closer to the sofa and looked behind it, and there was nothing there either. Then I looked in the doorway and nothing. 
there was just nothing anywhere. So, it confused, I, I just went back to bed. I just laid there thinking about it for a while and then there was some creaking from upstairs. And I'm thinking, good lord, what a nosy person. It's like 3am, why is she up? And how does she know that I'm even up? I mean, I was sneaking around my apartment trying not to be noticed in case there was an intruder in here. But again, I just pass it off as just another coincidence. I mean, she probably just went to the bathroom. My old lady bladder, right? But it was in 2015 that things really hit the fan. It was the worst year there ever and me coming home to the door being open continued. But the missing dishes continued and I had more incidents where I was woken up at night. On one occasion, there was even a growl that woke me up and it definitely wasn't Buffy. She was still sleeping next to me and then another time there was a loud banging on the front door. I looked through the peephole and there was nothing there. Then the banging on the floor started again and one night I was in the kitchen just washing dishes and there was that familiar bang right under my foot. It happened again the next night right under my foot but this time I was cooking at the stove. So... How the heck do they know where I'm standing? This is the lady downstairs, of course, that I'm thinking at the time, and I didn't understand what I did. I was just standing there cooking. I mean, I wasn't making any noise whatsoever. And I was so angry that I reported her to the office the next day. But the office administrator informed me that the lady downstairs wasn't home for the past few days because she had a mild stroke and was actually in hospital. Okay, so this lady had a stroke too? I would hate to live in that apartment, but I digress. So anyway, I just didn't know what to make of that, and I want to make a note here too. Remember how I said that between the floors there's just the subfloor and the drop ceiling? Well, how would someone bang on the ceiling if they had a drop ceiling? I mean, I guess they could go through the trouble of moving the ceiling tile, bang on the subfloor, and put the ceiling tile back, but... I just can't see an old lady doing this. I mean, if she were home, that is. And remember, too, that the previous lady was restricted to a wheelchair. And then, the knocking on the wall started. At first, it was just a faint knock on my bedroom wall, which is on the other side of the living room. Obviously, there was no one on the other side of the wall because the other side was my living room. I couldn't figure out where it was coming from, though, and it was just a faint knock every five minutes or so. Over the course of the next few weeks, the knocks travelled all over the living room walls though and got a lot louder and more frequent, lasting all day long in fact, coupled with the creaking of the walking from what I thought was the lady upstairs. And these footsteps, they began to follow me just all over the apartment. I kid you not. I was woken up too by what sounded like a jar of pennies or marbles or something thrown on the floor upstairs. It startled both Buffy and me just wide awake in the middle of the night. One night, it sounded like someone dropped a huge heavy object that I can only describe to be like a, a big lead safe on the floor right above my bedroom. I was actually awake for that one, but remember that this woman is 85 pounds soaking wet. I've had scratching noises in the wall of my bedroom too, like an animal was in the wall or something. Now, one evening I went into the bathroom and the familiar creaking followed me in there and then just all hell broke loose. Again, it was everything. Jar of pennies on the floor, tub of water on and off, sink water on and off, toilet flushing, creaking and I'm just standing there like what the hell is going on? Because I know that my upstairs neighbor was at the hospital for a back problem and there was just no one home in her apartment. Buffy too had had her share of barking at just nothingness and I actually managed to capture a video of her one day freaking out at something that I couldn't see. I was crocheting just watching TV and relaxing and she was lying right next to me and she then heard a noise in the living room or saw something. I don't know but she just started barking as if she was waiting for it to come back and show itself. And boy did it. After barking calmly at the doorway for a bit, she reacts as if something just walked right into view and at times her barking starts to escalate with growls as well. And she backs up as if something is coming towards her. She even ducks a few times as if she was trying to avoid being touched or something. Here's the video of that if you'd like to see it. What is it, honey? 
There have been three people who have died in that building just in the five and a half years that I've lived there. But one guy who lived next door to the lady above me, who was actually wheelchair bound, actually fell in his tub. He was dead for several days until Meals on Wheels found him and I was living there for that one. The other death was on the first floor near the elevator, way on the other side of the building. But reflecting on all of this, I, I do feel kind of bad about thinking that this lady was doing her best to just harass me and I feel even worse, or mostly embarrassed and stupid, for being paranoid and thinking that she was following me around the house, throwing things on the floor and breaking into my apartment. I honestly wanted so much to just try and find a rational explanation, but when I look back now, me believing that she was following me around was just totally preposterous. I do think though that the death of my other dog and the darkness it brought set just a, an already volatile environment ablaze with activity. I did finally move out, but here's the kicker. I now live just across the street, and I think that I'm far enough away. Well, I hope so.